heard, you know, heard by the mass media in that case. So you know, again, this, this can happen. You can have some very clear proofs or something goes wrong. Future technomania. I think that uh, kind of there is a, a difficulty in determining business and technology directions. Uh, Google, year 2000, people felt that there was no uh, business uh, case for Google. Okay. Uh, it uh, occasionally it pays to take a flyer on something which goes counter to uh, accepted wisdom. So you should be careful that you kind of don't do it when there's overwhelming evidence against it and don't waste hundred billion dollars on something where it obviously going to fail. Investing hundred million dollars in Google, that's a different story. Okay? But again, I think society is actually becoming in many ways less uh, kind of less realistic. Part of it has to do with technology. Who understands what you know uh, what photons are or, or what the bits of transport on the internet? Railroads were much more concrete, much more tangible. People had a better feeling for it. It was harder to fool them. Today it is. Uh, it, you know, it's harder. Today, I think you have this increasing credulous simplicity, and you have a kind of increasing uh, sort of situation where the collective hallucinations differ less and less from real business. Okay. What is it that makes Google so valuable? Human inertia. If people suddenly got upset with Google, say, if somebody could prove or even pass a semi-credible rumor that Brin and Page were subsidizing some neo-Nazi movement, you would see a mass movement of people away to Yahoo. Okay. Google's valuation could vaporize. Okay. That couldn't really happen before. So the difference between a viable business model and a collective hallucination is much lower now. So my guess is that uh, we're going to have many more kind of uh, uh, bad kind of uh, manias that are transparently kind of false, uh, it may not be bad for society. And you really need to encourage people to take risks. And kind of, it's not so much, uh, there is a book which says that it's, bubbles are good for you. Kind of, my conclusion is not so much that bubbles are good for you, but rather there's a set of mind which encourages people to go against accepted wisdom and take chances, uh, kind of leads kind of inevitably towards really bad manias, like the internet mania, where people just don't uh, exercise their uh, critical facilities. So I think it's going to be a very interesting future. I think it's going to be a, you know, uh, kind of, uh, a promising future. There's a lot that we can do out of technology, but I think there'll be many more panics too. And so it will be an interesting uh, world. Thank you very much for your patience. Time for a few questions. Please uh, put your hand up. Uh, professor Listo will call on you. Please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Bruce Johnson, professor of law here at the law school. Uh, and I think it was 1999 or 2000, Jeremy Siegel wrote a very interesting op ed in the Wall Street Journal comparing, I think, the South Sea Trading Company stock price bubble to the dot, what he predicted would be the dot com yes. bubble. And he said, uh, uh, he asked whether tremendous value would be created in the dot-com industry, and the same was true in South Sea Trade. Would the new world bring on yes. riches? Yes. But his basic point was, uh, what people failed to anticipate is that no firm would be able to basically privatize those benefits, that basically competition would dissipate those from a private standpoint. I'm just trying to rationalize that with what your story is yeah. about the railroads here. Now, one thing that's interesting about what you said, which is that the fa railroads fail to anticipate their costs. And that seems odd, because I mean, laying down track, you know, pretty much you have a good idea of what it's going to cost you per mile. So I guess the question I have, is there any evidence that in essence the railroads were racing to be out there ahead of one yeah. another, and in, in essence building their roads too fast, and that that was responsible for the excess cost? And if that's true, then that kind of maps into Jeremy Siegel's uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so there are several parts to what you said. Um, again, uh, let me try to keep it fairly short. I can give a longer lecture. Yes, they were definitely racing. So first of all, uh, there was a race to get permission of Parliament. Uh, so uh, again, long story about British public policy. But basically, even though Parliament was encouraging competition, it was not going to kind of allow two lines parallel to each other between different cities. So whoever managed to go there first 
no would kind of have control all over that route. And that definitely was a factor. Okay. Moreover, because they all piled in, that led to a rise in costs. Yes, so quite a substantial part of the increase in costs came from inflation. Now you are competing, you know, uh, price of iron uh, skyrocketed, price of labor skyrocketed, uh, which is engineers, surveyors, lawyers, or, I mean, lawyers earnings began because everybody wanted to get the two, three, or five top-notch parliamentary railway lawyers to work on their cases. All these costs went up to a large extent for, the, for that reason. So uh, yes, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, trying people jumping in there was a big factor to it. Uh, to go back, uh, so to go back to the uh, so, uh, Siegel uh, uh, kind of uh, paper, it's a very good question. I mean, in many ways, it's a very perceptive uh, uh, paper, but again, it's kind of a general qualitative kind of prediction, kind of hard to make concrete. Uh, as an exa another example, uh, some people have attributed. Okay, why did the say that Kambabu collapse around uh, March or April of 2000? Nobody really knows. Uh, it's all, often people attribute kind of causative factor an article in uh, in the Barons, uh, which compiled a listing of various high flying dot coms and saying, look, these guys have three to five months of cash and they are going to you know, to burn up after that. Okay. Well, maybe that was so, uh, but on the other hand, this was public knowledge, so it's simply assembled in one place. And second, why couldn't they have gotten more money? It's hard to tell. Some other people, those are conference on Babus a couple of years ago at, uh, uh, at Indiana University, that's why I'm citing it, uh, were also giving some credit or blame for the collapse to uh, Warren Buffett. About uh, a few months before the collapse, he gave a uh, presentation where he expressed himself very strongly. Generally speaking, Warren Buffett refuses to talk about general level markets. Yes, yes, I love this stock, I love Coca-Cola or I Washington Post or, or I dislike something else, but he doesn't say that stocks are overvalued. In that case, he said very, pretty explicitly, stocks are overvalued, went against the grain. And he said, for them to kind of sustain their level, at least one or more of the following three things have to happen, okay? that two of the three things which could happen did happen, okay? So again, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't, if for the dot comes, I mentioned from society's point of view, dot comes were a success, too. Okay. So I, I, all I'm saying is that the uh, internet babu or the long call fiber one, that was destined to fail, predicted, was predictable to fail and predicted just, and, and fail just as predicted, okay? So the dot comes, it's a little bit, a little bit different. Okay. Again, uh, going, going back to the Sego example, one of the things that happened was very su surprising is uh, after the tech crash, prof corporate profits in the United States grew tremendously. And uh, quite a bit of that uh, has been credited. And of course, now, now many of those uh, profits are turned out to be illusory, kind of vanishing the right of in the financial sector and other places. But for a while, many people uh, were attributing the rise in profits to increased productivity caused by the internet and you know, information technologies. And so that would be a, a case where kind of a, a, a precisely in line with Siegel's kind of thesis, where this sector of the economy produced huge advantages for the economy as a whole, but couldn't capture it for themselves. But again, it's, I, I'm not sure it could have been predicted by anybody precisely how it's going to happen. It's not in a quantitative form. I, I'm, in my cases, in these two bubbles, I'm looking for things where one can point to, like, you know, there are only a hundred sacks of gold dust out there, genuine gold, gold dust. You know, the remaining 900 have got to be, you know, common manure or something else, okay? And I think those cases I, I claim I can document it. In the other cases, yes, I, I, all of these things are appealing, but they are not quite as uh, conclusive, not as quite as empirical. Okay. So I think that David has a question. Um, David Eisenberg. Right. Um, as I understand it, the railroad bubble took place in um, a, what was then a five or six hundred year history of English common law that led to common carriage and yeah. the railroads were considered, as I understand it, common carriers. Yes. Speaking of analogies to the present day, was there any pressure either um, uh, during, before, or after either of the two railroad <coughs> bubbles to um, uh, 
push the boundaries of the notion of common carriage or do away with it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, okay, this is again a, a fascinating lecture, which I, you know, I could spend an hour or more on it. In fact, there was a dra dramatic change which took place between the two railway manias, in the 1830s and 1840s. The early railroads in both the United States and England were chartered on the principle of structural separation. Charters envisaged that this would be railroads. Okay, that the kind of the owners, the uh, uh, joint stock companies would would lay down these rails and lease them out to anybody who came with their own, you know, horse-drawn carriages, locomotive-drawn carriages, etc. etc. Okay, and then uh, by late 1830s, so this started breaking down, and uh, again there are some really wonderful stories. Um, so basically, railways decided that it was going to be more profitable for them to control carriage. And there's a wonderful testimony by so one manager interview being uh, kind of uh, uh, scrutinized or questioned by parliamentary committee. It says, well, aren't you obliged to let other people come with their locomotives and wagons onto your races? Yes, indeed, but I'm not obliged to provide them with water or, or coal for the locomotives or with places to unload their cargo. Okay, so I you know, okay, there was an issue, and Parliament basically gave up. Well, of course, this was all under the grounds of safety. Oh, yes, the main argument the railways were making is sorry, we cannot assure safety in here. Now, the interesting thing is they actually managed to uh, to set up a system whereby you know, uh, well, actually, another story about railway clearing house, but they had come on, uh, uh, so called running grounds when one line would have its trains running over the lines of, of another line. When they, when they wanted to, they were able to overcome the safety problems. But most of the time, they didn't want to do it, as they didn't want to do it for carriers. By the 1840s, this had been given up. Basically, Parliament decided, no, it couldn't control it. But some other fights uh, related to common carriage went on uh, through the courts uh, into the 1870s or so, for example, the small parcel fights. Uh, again, I, let me not go into it right now. But yes, there are fa fascinating stories in terms of in terms of law. I mean, railways had a huge impact on the development of law, both in England and the United States. Look at liability law. You know, who's at fault if, uh, say, a, a train kills somebody, a passenger, or a stand, or, or an employee, or somebody who just happens to be you know, crossing the tracks? Uh, they had a big impact, uh, but also in terms of common courage. Uh, Tom Hazlett. Um, so, so this uh, basically rejects my theory. I, I thought PowerPoint caused the dot com crash. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can get a technology bu bubble okay. without those wonderful hockey stick diagrams on PowerPoint. That's, that's right. Yeah. You can. Uh, but uh, two um, things. First, uh, maybe you answered this and I missed it, but uh, what was the rate of return then of the second British Railway bubble? You said it was 5% of the first one. That sounds yes. like it was. Uh, maybe not risk-adjusted uh, competitive return, but, but, but close. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I don't know if that's a bubble or not. Um, the second one, uh, I, I assume you're saying that the rate of return was considerably less than 5%. Yes. The other thing is, going to the, uh, uh, the more recent uh, experience, a lot of the internet bubble uh, swallowed, in this I guess you'd call it mass hallucination, it swallowed a lot of businesses that weren't really internet businesses at all. So I'm just going to use your example, Webvan. Webvan was not an internet business. Uh, in fact, it, it, the, 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 the home shopping model, or the home delivery uh, grocery model, uh, was developed under telephone and fax, and then just rolled over with, with no uh, appreciable efficiencies. Um, some, but, but uh, it's not as though this is going to revolutionize the, the, the business. But a lot of a lot of businesses like that were swept up. I mean, there are other things like like Amazon or Google, yes, that are internet businesses. But uh, but there are a lot of these uh, things getting financed and then pumped up. You know, Pets.com and so sure. forth uh, that that really were um, uh, you know completely unjustified at the times. So, but but, the, but the, what I want to say about that is that it was not a physical. There was nothing complicated. It, you know, it wasn't. Again, it's not the photons and the traffic. So this this was just this was yes. uh, this was just people missing the the basic business model that was that was being assisted right. by the internet. Yes. Okay. So let me do it in reverse. Yes, absolutely. And there are again some other delicious analogies. There was a, a, case, a famous case, I forget the name, during the internet bubble, where a company kind of changed its name to .com and its stock price skyrocketed as a result. 
uh, in the 1840s was a case where some company at the railway to its title 